Hello again, welcome back to the Real World Prepper. As always, if you like the content that you're going to find here, please click that subscribe button and the bell notifications. I'd love to have you back on any future videos. Uh, today, we're going to continue with Are You Sure You Are Ready to Defend Yourself? Part 2. Uh, in part one, we talked about the need to defend ourselves uh, in a post-SHTF situation, or frankly, any situation where you're threatened, and uh, the fact that if you're not a weapons person or a gun person, that, that frankly, you should be, or at the very least, should be able to uh, handle and manipulate these firearms and understand how they work. And we're going to go into a little bit more why that uh, right after this intro. Stick around. Okie dokie, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again, really, for joining. I appreciate it. Um, so part two of uh, are you sure you're ready to defend yourself? Um, like I said, we talked about the, the initial fact that, that there's a good likelihood um, that in a post-SHTF situation, uh, if not other everyday situations, you will find yourself, certainly in a post-SHTF situation, find yourself at some point in need of protecting yourself. Someone's going to come after you that has nothing and driven by the fact that they have nothing to lose, okay? <clears throat> so, if uh, if you didn't see part one, I'm going to attempt to put the link in the description. Uh, so, I say attempt because I don't know that I've ever actually effectively done that. So, I'm going to make an attempt to do that. If, if, if it, for some reason that doesn't work out, uh, go to my channel just click on the banner and you'll you'll see it there. Okay, part one. So anyway, all right. So, like where we left off yesterday is, uh, uh, if you're not a firearms guy, you need to at least, or person rather, you need to at least be uh, familiar with this stuff. Um, the more varied type of weapons that you practice with or get familiar with, the the more versatile you will be in understanding and being able to use these things. Um, okay, so one thing to consider is that all firearms in their most basic sense have the same functions, okay? There are different, uh, there are different, they look different, different ways of doing things, but the same essential uh, function. You, uh, Let's say, uh, at least by knowing how to operate firearms, whether or not you own them or want to, but at least by knowing how to operate firearms, if a tragic scenario takes place where you have the good fortune to find a weapon or take a weapon away from a potential attacker, you might just be able to use it effectively if you have some skills, even if you're not interested in carrying one yourself and that's not your thing. I'm hoping this uh, series will also encourage you to, to, if you don't already, to purchase a weapon train with it, learn how to use it, be comfortable with it. And it's it's a good thing to protect yourself in all scenarios anyway, in just everyday life. I'm a big believer in the Second Amendment and being able to protect ourselves in that way as human beings. Okay, so, uh, before you can think in this manner and take on more than you know how to take on as far as weapons, uh, you, you, again, you need to learn some of the basics. Learning how to operate one type of revolver, for example, will allow you to figure out another type, even if there's slight differences. Um, it's not Hollywood. Guns need to be loaded and they need to be reloaded. You can't just fire off a gazillion rounds with no end. It's not how it works, okay? And, uh, just because you may not want to handle firearms does not mean that your future and potential attackers feel the same way. All right, so once you get into this mindset, and I encourage you to think about it in this way, and again, let me stress, not be uh, consumed by anything except God's love, and I mean that, but always be vigilant in thinking about these things, just like you think about what you've got to get at the grocery store and where your kid has to be on Thursday afternoons and you know what you're gonna cook for dinner and the fact that you've got a meeting at work you know next week or whatever the case is in the same way you need to go through life thinking about different things in your everyday reach okay I showed you this yesterday okay you know a hammer 
But let's say, uh, let's say you're in your office at work. Just presuming you have an office at work, right? And a lamp on the desk, right? Well, look at that lamp and see where would I grab that lamp and which end would be the end that I'd want to attack somebody with or rather defend myself from an attacker with. You're going to be looking at things differently. You should be looking at things differently. Um, I hate to use this analogy or this example, but think about Jason Bourne. If you hadn't seen any of those movies, look at them. They're cool movies. But you know, Jason Bourne can take anything from you know he can he can you know take this guy and make it a weapon. And you know, of course, that's the movies. But 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 the fact is, if you look at things differently, you walk in your office, you see the lamp as something a little different. You know, uh, how would I? If I were to use this as an impact weapon, how would I hold it? Uh, what end would I would I strike somebody with? Uh, loose items laying about can easily become uh, either a weapon or a distraction at the very least to get you uh, away. Anyone's home can become an armory in ways, even without weapons. Uh, beyond kitchen knives, uh, any item almost can be used as an impact weapon. A penetration weapon or cover and concealment, think island in your kitchen or, the, or behind your couch if it sits away from the wall or you know anything like that. After you learn the fundamentals of common firearms operations, which I encourage you to do, uh, where you can safely load and effectively shoot a wide range of firearms, uh, you're still not ready at that point. You are one step ahead, but you're still not ready. Um, even after you look at everyday items as improvised weapons habitually, and I recommend considering these things, uh, you're still not ready to defend against violent attackers. There is a non-physical aspect of of an attack or an offense against you um, having to to defend your life uh, there is a non-physical part of that that will kick in um, you need to prepare your mind for the potential violence just as importantly you need to prepare for the physiological effects the psychological effects uh, you know at the end of a violent encounter, that stuff doesn't just go away, right? It can sometimes, in some people's instances, remain with them for a lifetime. Um, just talk to anybody that's been to war, that's killed people, and seen people killed around them, or a policeman. And I, I do not speak this stuff from experience, okay? Let me add that. I am, you know, I've never killed anyone. I've never been shot at, or no one's tried to kill me that I know of, uh, you know, so, so I will fall into many of these same categories, some of these same things I will experience if this happens to me, I'm sure, okay? This is why this is important for me too, guys. Um, I, I learn as I try and share this stuff with you guys. There are many facets of a violent encounter that affect the outcome of the encounter, especially when your life or your family's life is at stake. During a life and death encounter where one or more attackers might be intent on taking your possessions or your life and maybe assaulting your family members, you will endure the highest stress ever that you have ever that you can't even imagine. This stress uh, will negatively affect you one, your physical ability to respond, two, your mental capability to think, uh, and three, coping with the measures uh, for the aftermath. You can lessen but never really eliminate these negative effects with some preparation. So with preparation you can lessen these effects. Um, the immediate physical effects that one usually would experience during a life and death encounter, they'll affect your motor skills, alter your audio and visu uh, visual, visual perception, your heart rate and breathing will increase, you may have uncontrolled trembling. Uh, if any of you guys have ever been in a life and death situation, or even if it hasn't been somebody pointing a gun at you, trying to kill you, you know, these things are super, super stressful. You know, you, if you've been through super stressful things that where you can tell that your body kicked into a totally different mode, then you'll know what it is that I'm speaking of. So. Uh, uncontrollable trembling, uh, potentially loss of bowel and bladder movements. <clears throat> you might experience tunnel vision. Your field of vision may be restricted so uh, narrowly that all you can see is the gun or the threat or the something and, and, and you don't hear anything except the clicking, you know, of the next uh, chambering of a round or something to that effect. For that matter, a small 22 caliber rifle, which is like a pop, may sound like a cannon to your ears. Um, 
it, it will affect you and change you. Seemingly easy tasks such as, you know, unsnapping a holster or pushing the safety button on a holster if you've got one, you know, or just the draw itself will become so more so much more difficult with when your hands are trembling and your heart rate is jacked up and uh, your motor skills will diminish and decrease. Uh, that's why cops and, and military, you know, they train under stressful situations. Uh, I would even encourage that you guys at some point maybe even take a, uh, I forget what they call these courses, but you know, they do these tactical training courses with firearms, uh, contest type stuff, speed type stuff. Uh, under pressure type stuff, people screaming at you type stuff uh, at, during during this this type of test or assessment. Um, the passage of time may feel distorted in the moment if you're being threatened, uh, if your life is being threatened. Uh, everything seems like it may move in slow motion. The physical reactions to a life and death situation are instinctive to the human body. Okay, so this is just what happens. Like I say, your blood flow uh, increases. Uh, your heart rate goes up, uh, increased oxygen through the rapid breathing, uh, uh, perceptional changes and all that kind of good stuff. Just like uh, if you were being chased by a lion, you would know that you need to run fast. You would, it would just kick in, you know. So a lot of these things are going to just kick in. Uh, we need to maintain in this scenario our dexterity in handling our weapons, control of our bodily functions to fight, and our mind to think. So this is where this type of stress training comes into play. Um, if you start practicing some of these things, even if you don't go to a class or sign up for something, if you start just constantly practicing these things, going to the range as often as you can, um, drawing and dry firing your weapon, you know, uh, things like that. Even if you're not into this stuff, I encourage you to, to get into this stuff. Um, we need to maintain our dexterity, uh, control of bodily functions, our mind to think. The only practical method of doing this is through self-induced practice, what I was just saying. So we need to practice uh, shooting competitions, like I said, uh, or those type of classes are certainly uh, one example. They will condition your body and mind to automatically perform some of these tasks. Uh, practicing the manipulation of a weapon to the point that thinking is not needed to perform will be one check mark off your box of things that you need to kind of have and possess. Um, Scenario-based training, like I spoke of, uh, but in this case, you could do like paintball guns or laser tag or anything like that. They imprint on your mind uh, the consistent responses and reactions, right? So it becomes more like, you know, you hear the term, oh, it's like riding a bike, you never forget. Well, you can forget this skill. Uh, but to practice it will bring it more to the forefront as if you're riding a bike, okay? Uh, an example, continually reacting to a role that reaches for a weapon in a specific manner such as reaching in the waistband, trains your mind. And this is, uh, this is, sorry, this is watching somebody else. Let's say you're looking at people, which I do this all the time. I'm a watcher. I watch people. I watch their hands. I look at their waistband. I see how they're talking to somebody, how they're acting, how they're responding, if they're looking around, what they're, I, I cannot not do it, okay? I'm not saying I'm some super expert, but I cannot not do that, and I do it all the time. Um, these types of things, if you train your mind to look for these things, they will definitely give you small gestures, or you will pick up on small gestures that might identify a threat and give you time to react. Uh, practice in anything makes perfect and by training your body to arm itself automatically when a threat is perceived will allow your brain to focus on other important issues so if you get the muscle memory down and that kind of thing and you and you start to your nerves start to settle in these situations with practice then in a real situation it might give you that much more of an advantage to be able to think critically in the midst of all this while you're still going to have increased heart rate and trembling hands and 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 you know fear uh, but maintaining control of your body and your mind uh, as much as possible will allow you to be to have the most effective means of defending yourself and your family um, you can't control an adrenaline dump if that happens it's going to happen but be able to recognize put yourself in some situations where you can practice this again some of this tactical training would be good but uh, uh 
I don't know how else to tell you to go do it, you know, I mean, unless you have your spouse jump out and scare you or something, you know, on a regular basis. I don't know. You got to figure that part out yourself, okay? But if, you, if you'll do these things, it will help to train you and, and you'll get some of this muscle memory down. Um, knowing, knowing that trembling doesn't necessarily mean that you're afraid or you have to be afraid, uh, but that it's a normal reaction can be the difference between life and death in these situations. When, when it allows you to, to know that the effects you're feeling are temporary and are part of what is a natural Psycho, uh, physiological and physical effect on your body in these types of uh, life or death situations, it can allow your brain to still be able to critically think about what to do. Okay, that's all I'm going to cover today in part two. Just a little, some of the ways that you can train yourself to be ready for these types of things. Uh, we've got another very important aspect we're going to talk, uh, talk about in part three. Probably the most, I don't know if it's the most important, but it's very important. Um, we'll talk about that in part three. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you're enjoying this little series. Uh, seemed like a whole lot to cover in one video, and I'm even sort of kind of squashing it in this. But listen, hey, if you enjoy, uh, if you enjoy this content, please subscribe. If you're not already subscribed to my subscribers, thank you so much. Please share this stuff if you think it's important. If you've got friends and family members that need to be on the same page, need to know this stuff, share this stuff with them, guys. I don't mind. I'd love for you to. Um, thanks to all my new subscribers. You guys check in with me next time. This is it for today. Real World Prepper. Thank you. Bye-bye.